Hello? Okay, everything works. Excellent. So, uh, hello and welcome here. It's great that uh, many of you came. I'm Maki Tsubi, I'm from the Institute of Philosophy. And uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Stephen Darwall, uh, Darwall to, to Prague. Welcome. As most of you probably know, Stephen Darwall is a uh, professor of moral philosophy at, at, at Yale. He's most famous for second personal ethics, uh, the book Second Person Standpoint, and for his, his sort of ventures into history of moral philosophy. But, but I think he'll talk about these things himself. So without further ado, let's welcome Stephen Darwell. First, can you hear me okay? Great, okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Matt. It's a great honor, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, this place actually, for reasons you wouldn't know, is close to my heart. It's going to be about the heart today. In 1989, uh, I was listening to the radio and hearing about the philosophy students in Charles University who were part of the Velvet Revolution. It was a long, quite long report on National Public Radio that I actually taped. Um, and uh, there was one student in particular, Natasha Dudinska. I don't know if that name means anything to anyone here. Uh, she now is a filmmaker in Israel, uh, goes by the name Natasha Dudinsky. Uh, and she was very much involved in it. And her voice talking about the, her experiences uh, as part of that was just really quite moving. Uh, so that moved me then, it's moved me since. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here and very happy to have the invitation. So this is going to be about matters of the heart. Uh, that's not something that analytical philosophers typically talk about. Uh, I think for many different reasons. I think we philosophers tend to live lives from our heads and less from our hearts. That's what philosophy is. It's using reason to reflect on stuff. But among the stuff we could reflect on would be matters of the heart. So we need further explanation to know why philosophers have tended to talk about it less. I think you know, there's a lot of interest in like love and friendship and relationship, especially since the 1980s, at least in the United States, and Anglophone philosophy. Um, but when philosophers talk about love and talk about um, friendship and personal relationship, they tend to talk about things like sharing the same point of view, or reasoning together, or taking each other as ends, or as in David Bellman, a former colleague of mine's paper on love as a moral emotion, being struck by the intrinsic value of another person. They don't tend to talk about heartfelt connection. They don't tend to talk about our vulnerability in, uh, to one another. There are exceptions. Uh, there was a very fine 1960s Danish philosopher, theologian, uh, uh, Knud Lugstra, K.E. Lugstra, who wrote some really wonderful stuff about it, which uh, we've talked about a bit and written about a bit. So I'm writing this book. It's called The Heart and Its Attitudes. And what I'm going to show you folks uh, is taken from that. And I'll be interested in your questions and objections and to discuss this with you. Okay, let's see if this works. I have to apologize in advance for the quality of the PowerPoint. Uh, I, I did it in Keynote and then put it over into PowerPoint, and I thought I had all of the formatting prop correct. It isn't. Uh, but, uh, so with your forbearance, let's, let's proceed here. So here we have P.F. Strawson, Peter F. Strawson, author of a very important paper called Freedom and Resentment which probably had as much influence as any philosophical paper in English in the 20th century. Uh, it's about freedom and resentment, and so part of what it's about is the issue of freedom of the will. I'm not so much interested in that. I'm a moral philosopher and a moral psychologist, 
I'm interested in what he called reactive attitudes and the idea of a distinctive stance or standpoint from which we have these attitudes. It's what he called the participant stance. It's what I call the second person standpoint. It's the perspective of implicit relation to someone, not just the idea that one is in relationship with respect to someone, but implicitly relating to them. So it involves what we might call address. It's what involves thoughts that we naturally express with a second person pronoun, you, or in the South, in the United States, y'all, or in Pittsburgh, yins, and so on. Um, not sure what it is in Czech, uh, but you can tell me later. Okay. Uh, so, that, so that's Strawson. That photograph picture was taken by Simon Blackburn, uh, who is a pretty well-known British philosopher. Okay. Um, so Strawson gives different kinds of examples of reactive attitudes. He never actually tells us exactly what a reactive attitude is. He gives various features of them that have been taken to be criteria of reactive attitudes. I think one of the nice things that falls out of the material I'm presenting today is that you can get a perfectly general characterization of reactive attitudes, and we may end up with, with that. Um, so the standard examples that people have been talking about, including myself, uh, are what we might call the deontic examples. These are attitudes which are conceptually implicated in deontic moral notions. By deontic, I mean having to do with duty or obligation. So the deontic moral notions are notions like right, wrong, rights, wronging, um, requirement, moral requirement, moral permission. And if you know about deontic logic, you can model these notions in a deontic logic. Um, okay. But Strawson also gives, well, I should say one last thing about them. They're all connected to the idea of accountability. Being in a relationship, an implied relationship of mutual accountability. So the thought is that all these deontic moral notions can be defined in terms of accountability. Here's one definition. What it is for an act to be wrong as a conceptual matter is for it to be an act of a kind that it would be blameworthy, where blame is a reactive attitude. It's an attitude through which we hold a person accountable. Um, uh, for an action, for that act, unless the person did it with excuse. Okay, so the, the idea is that all deontic moral notions involve the, reactive, the deontic reactive attitudes conceptually. It's just part of the very concept. But Strawson also gives these non-deontic examples of gratitude, love, forgiveness, and hurt feelings. So the canonical deontic ones are blame and guilt and resentment, and the non-deontic ones are attitudes like that come through personal connection of you know, being open to someone and being hurt, let's say, by them, or, and I don't mean, you know, suffering physical pain, I mean heart pain, uh, some kind of wound of the heart. Um, Gratitude, which I'll try to be arguing, is, <clears throat> involves a kind of opening of one's heart to a benefactor, uh, and so on. So, so I and a number of other people, Gary Watson, uh, 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 R.J. Wallace, a number of others, have been theorizing about the deontic cases. And I think what I try to do in the second person standpoint is to provide a foundation for deontic morality. When I was growing up, I faced the question, we all face it, what grounds morality? And I was the son of an Episcopalian clergyman, and I thought, well, could it be God? You know, that was the sort of standard view, is God. And I realized, uh, I was in, at least in, in undergraduate, I guess, when I realized this, God doesn't help, actually. So it wasn't God, so I thought, what is it? Well, I looked around, and I think I found it. I think it's in something that's presupposed in second personal, a certain kind of second personal relation. is a presupp necessary presupposition <clears throat> of uh, second personal address. Uh, we can get into that maybe in the question period, if you're interested. Um, 
But very recently, people have started to look at these other cases, the non-deoptive cases. And I've written a few things about it. A number of other people have been writing some things about these non-deoptive cases. And what I'm out trying to do in this book, The Heart and Its Attitudes, is to give a general account of these heartfelt uh, non-deontic reactive attitudes. OK, so you'll see a bit of that today. So here's our first <laughs> formatting problem. I beg your indulgence. Uh, OK, so the idea is that all reactive attitudes are felt from what Strawson calls a participant stance. That's what I call the second person perspective. They have always involved an implicit relating to the object of, of the attitude. Um, the contrast is what he, with what he calls an objective stance. And that's the standpoint of a third person. It's an it's a observer's perspective. So if you want to feel for this, uh, one kind of strong example that Strawson gives is, you know, here we are. We're having a conversation, you and I. It's you, plural, and I. Um, and we're just presupposing certain things about one another when we have this conversation. I'm presupposing that you can understand what I'm saying, that you're capable of assessing the reasons that I'm giving for my view. And uh, I'm presupposing that you're presupposing that I'm likewise capable of that. So there are these reciprocal presuppositions of the mutual relating that is just built into the very idea of conversation. <clears throat> but, you know, suppose you came to believe that I was a chat GPT uh, and not an actual person, right? You all know what that? Yeah. Some, some of you may not, but uh, it's, uh, let's say, a computer, an AI device, right? Um, well, then you'd start to view me differently. <laughs> You wouldn't be seeing me any longer. You wouldn't be attempt to be relating to me in the same rich way that we do with one another. You'd see me as, a, as something to observe. You'd say, well, let's see, if he, let's see what he comes up with next. Okay. So that would be an example of the third person stance. When I use the term second person, I don't necessarily mean another person. So second person is a grammatical category. First person, second person, third person. It can be singular or it can be plural, right? But you can have a second person's standpoint on yourself as well. And I would argue we do when we feel guilt. When we feel guilt, we feel as if addressed, but not essentially by we ourselves. It's by, it's by we ourselves as occupying the perspective of a representative person or a member of the moral community. So. To make this distinction, I'll distinguish between second person, which is this sort of grammatical or logical category, and second party, which means another person. Okay? So the first, I'm just going to say a little bit at the beginning here about deontic reactive attitudes. The main action is going to be with these non-deontic attitudes of the heart. Uh, the deontic attitudes all mediate mutual accountability. So they're all essentially interpersonal, okay, um, in the sense of being second personal. That is, they all involve the implicit address of another. What does that mean? Because you, when you have an attitude, you're not necessarily actually addressing someone. It means that the thought that you're having is ex naturally expressed in the second person. Like, you can't do that to me. Or, uh, would you please get your foot off my foot? Okay, that sort of thing. Or would you please acknowledge that you placed your foot on my foot intentionally? <laughs> would you please say you're sorry for placing your foot intentionally on my foot? Would you please pay my doctor's bill for having broken my toe when you intentionally put your foot on my foot? You get the idea. Okay. Um, so, and they implicitly make a demand, as in the case, I use please, but of course that means, you know, that's just a matter of politeness. I'd be presupposing that I have a legitimate claim that you get off my foot and all the rest. And maybe, I, and I'm, I'm demanding that you do so, but it's not a mere demand. I'm not just trying to, as it were, 
linguistically push you off my foot, I'm expressing the idea that I have a legitimate claim that you get off my foot. So, and I'm bidding for acknowledgement of that from you. Uh, they come, all these attitudes come with what I call an implicit RSVP, Responde Lucy Dupla. So, this is uh, an example I like to use to get across the idea. These are some Italian ice dancers from uh, not the most recent Winter Olympics, but maybe a couple ago in Torino. Um, and uh, they're very close to the metal, and they have like one minute left in the routine. And this is Barbara Fuserpoli and Maurizio Margaglio. Maurizio drops Barbara Fuserpoli. Not a good thing. They're on the ice for a long time. They get up off the ice, and she looks at Maurizio. Uh, and she really looks at Maurizio. <laughs> and the point is, she's not just looking at him. She's looking to him to say something like, you know, the, 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 it's the look is saying, what did you just do exactly? What, could you please tell me what you had in mind with that? Okay. Now we have to, you know, we all know this, in sport, this is in sports, and we don't really think of people necessarily blaming other people in sports, but actually they do, right? Um, so I, all I need in this example is that she likely feels resentment um, um, and blame, and she's looking into his eyes. Okay, that's crucial. So here's another sort of graphic. So these Deontic React edges are eyes on eyes on eyes on eyes on eyes on eyes on eyes attitudes. That is, they, they imply reciprocation. Um, and what I argue is that moral accountability is always, in its nature, second personal. Uh, it always involves a a putatively legitimate demand. It also, but it doesn't, it, it provides it in a, in a respectful way because it's also presupposing that just as the other person is accountable to you, so you are accountable to the other person. So it's insinuating a relationship of mutual respect and it's, it's claiming that the other person failed to respect you and your legitimate claims, and it's calling on them to return to the relationship of mutual respect. Um, okay. It also doesn't characterize, so this is a sort of point about the difference between contempt and blame. Contempt is a characterizing attitude. You have it not towards the individual as an individual, but towards the individual as exemplifying a certain kind. One of those losers, something like that. Okay. Um, and so it relates to the other as an individual and implicitly values the other as an individual. So, in respecting someone, in a sense, you're acknowledging their dignity as a being who's in a position to demand or claim respect. So, that's in general the, the character of these uh, deontic attitudes. Um, by contrast, we have someone here who's feeling something like contempt or disdain. So a very natural expression of that attitude is the rolling of the eyes. I think you all recognize that uh, expression. When you roll your eyes, you're precisely taking them out of position to look into the other person's eyes. Right? Contempt is not about engagement. It's about disengagement. It's about um, and it's expressed most naturally not to the object of contempt, but to what I would call the cognoscenti off stage. So if that had been Barbara Fuserpoli uh, there on the ice, it's supposed what she did was that she didn't look resentfully to Maurizio, but she just rolled her eyes and skated off. So who would that be expressed to? Well, not to Maurizio, it would be expressed to the people in the stands. 
could you see what he just did? Something like that. So that's a third personal attitude and has all kinds of really interesting features that are really very different, profoundly different from respect and blame and resentment. Okay. Um, so Deontic Grant attitudes like blame and resentment hold their objects accountable. Unlike these other critical attitudes that are third personal, like contempt, they implicitly address their objects second personally and call on them to hold themselves accountable. They especially they respectfully call for respect and presuppose mutual accountability. Uh, now, this, sorry, we get into the formatting. This is a passage from uh, Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiment. So, Ludic Secretary just at lunch showed me the first edition of Ludic of, of uh, Smith's theory of moral sentiments from 1759. If you don't know this book and you're interested in moral psychology, I think it's the best thing ever written in English on moral psychology. Uh, but what Smith says is that what our resentment is chiefly intent upon is not that, uh, is not so much to make, I put in the wrongdoer, feel pain in his turn, as to make him conscious that he feels it upon account of his past conduct, to make him repent of that conduct, and to make him sensible that the person whom he injured do not deserve to be treated in that manner. That is, to make the person feel that they've disrespected someone's dignity. Um, and that, I submit, is itself a form of respect. So these deontic reactive attitudes um, express a demand for respect, but they also express respect. So they are what I would call will-to-will -will attitudes. They express a demand of the will. Demand has to come from the will, but it's to someone as having a will as a person, so an equal moral person. Uh, so my work on the second person standpoint is, is really just all about drawing out the presuppositions of these attitudes. So just as I was saying here, when you and I have a conversation, we, we have to presuppose certain things about one another. So likewise, whenever we have one of these deontic reactive attitudes, we have to be presupposing our common, what I call second personal competence, our ability to hold ourselves accountable to one another and to ourselves, uh, to have certain kinds of reactive attitudes, not just from our own particular perspective, but from a perspective that's impartial as between the two of us. It's not a third person perspective, it's still second personal in the sense that it involves implicit address, but it purports to be impartial. So the idea is roughly we're presupposing that the person we hold accountable has a conscience. So that's second personal competence, and then I make an argument that I really can't go into now about why any being with second personal competence, why we're committed to thinking that any such being has a, a, a shared basic second personal authority, has dignity, and that you can use that to get, that can ground deontic morality, and, that, and I argue in other places that can give us the, the kind of content we want, and that can ground what I call, you know, well, what is generally called contractualism as a kind of normative moral theory. But that's all on the deontic side. But what we're most want to focus on today um, are the non deontic cases. So by contrast, these don't involve any mutual expectations. When you love someone, or when you trust them, or when you're feeling gratitude towards them, or as I'll show you in a moment, when you feel remorse as opposed to guilt, you're opening your heart in a way that's inviting a certain kind of heartfelt response from the other, but you can't expect it. You don't have any claim on their love. You don't have any claim on their trust. You don't have any claim on their gratitude. So they involve a heartfelt expression to another heart. Your heart opens to them. And what you're hoping for is that their heart will open to yours in response. And so it always invites reciprocation. Like, like the Deontic ones, it comes with an implicit RSVP. Would you? Um, but in this case, it's invitational and aspirational. So it involves what I call a heart-to-heart -heart relation. 
whereas the deontic ones involve a will-to-will -will relation. So I just call them second personal attitudes of the heart, and we could call the other ones second personal attitudes of the will. Uh, so here's an example. So in English, uh, people <laughs> tend to use the word guilt and the word remorse pretty, well, it turns out they don't, but I think they think they use it pretty comparably. Uh, it turns out that there are two pretty distinct emotions here, pretty distinct attitudes. Guilt on the one hand and remorse on the other. So guilt involves a feeling of acknowledging culpable wrong, being to blame. Okay, I did it. Got to take responsibility for it. So you feel responsible in the sense of you are account you're holding yourself accountable to another who has a legitimate claim on you, uh, and it's a way of taking responsibility for what you did. Remorse by contrast, though it typically involves the thought of some wrongdoing, it doesn't have to. Cases of agent regret that are discussed by people like Bird Williams and Thomas Nagel and so on, I think are also instances of remorse. These are cases where you cause, often culpably, bad things for another person. Pain, sorrow, um, uh, a heart wound of some kind inconvenience. And the focus is on what you do to them, not on the wrong. And unlike a setting, guilt, which involves a kind of setting of the will, uh, remorse is a kind of sorrow. I feel sorry that I've, you know, I caused this hurt to you. Um, so we have this term being heartsick, okay, heartsick with remorse. Um, okay, so guilt is the sense that one's violated and justified demand or requirement and must take responsibility for that. It's an attitude of the will. It focuses on what one did, in, you know, through one's will, intentionally or negligently, by not exercising one's will as one was required to do. Uh, and it involves some kind of taking responsibility for that. Not, not fully, it's just the beginning of that. It's the feeling of being responsible. And um, you might, you know, I, I think it's somewhat a mistake to think that you're sort of imposing a cost on yourself with the pain of guilt. It's rather a painful sense of the wrong that you did. So the pain you're feeling is not, as it were, deserved because of what you did. It's rather it's the painful recognition of what one did and one's responsibility for what one did. Okay. Now, though remorse can involve guilt, uh, it adds another element, sorrow or sadness, or the pain and suffering one has caused. It involves heartfelt care or concern for the person. It's an attitude of the heart. Um, now there's an example that Liz Anderson actually, who was a colleague of mine at the University of Michigan, Elizabeth Anderson, told me about this, just completely compelling. Um, there's a man named Richard Boothman, who was employed by the University of Michigan hospitals. So big university hospitals, all hospitals in the United States, uh, get sued a lot by people who think that they committed malpractice. Often they do commit malpractice. But anyway, so there are all these suits. And so there are people who work for the hospital that are hired to try to reduce the costs of these suits as much as possible. And what these people typically do is to have a big staff of lawyers uh, and then to threaten legal power uh, and say, yeah, you could sue. <laughs> But we've got 57 lawyers and we're much, you know, and I really don't advise that you do that. Uh, how about we agree we'll pay you this amount uh, as compensation? And it's, you know, it's, it's they attempt to come in low. Uh, now, the interesting thing is they were still losing a lot of money in these suits. 
Um, so this is kind of Richard Booth when he comes in, and he's a lawyer, but he also, I, I don't know quite how he came to this idea, but he came to the idea that they might actually be able to save money and also make everybody involved feel a whole lot better about the situation if they took another path. So and when I say everybody, I mean including the doctors and the hospital staff. Because if you make a settlement, that doesn't really help the doctors at all. They still feel they have what we call moral injury. They have this, they have on their conscience, uh, or they, they feel remorse. They feel like, I killed this person. Or I, you know, this person's not gonna be able to walk again, or whatever it is. So what he convinced the hospital staff to do was to meet with the victim or the family of the victim in the case <clears throat> that the victim is no longer around and tell them exactly what they did, be completely transparent, talk them directly, and let them see how they feel about it. And typically what, well, there's this one example that he gives that's really quite compelling of a young man, Arab American, who comes into the emergency room and he just thinks he's got headaches uh, and, you know, eight hours later he's dead and the family doesn't really understand <clears throat> what, what's happened. And uh, so anyway, so the doctors felt awful about it. The family was outraged. So there was a meeting, and it didn't start well. People were throwing things. <laughs> um, and the, the family had a lawyer. And the lawyer said, hey, you know, come cool it. Uh, you don't understand how rare it is for hospitals even to, to be in this kind of case. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, so the doctors said what happened. And they started to cry. And the family started to cry. And, you know, within five, ten minutes, they're in each other's arms. Uh, and they're consoling one another. And then they're showing photographs of Ahmed. And so this is, this, you know, and, oh, you know, oh, so safe, whatever. Anyway, so it's a completely different thing. Uh, and the crucial thing here is that even just settlements cannot heal heart wounds. If you feel terrible, uh, you know, claimants, suppose they get a just settlement, that doesn't do anything to how they, you know, they may feel vindicated or they may feel justice has been done, but they still feel hurt. They still feel um, a kind of wound uh, in their heart. And a thing that can, can really address that is some kind of opening of another person's heart. So remorse opens the heart to the victim in the hope that the victim will be willing to have their heart open to them in return, and that makes possible, it doesn't always make possible also, of course, but it can make possible uh, a kind of mutual um, atonement and um, reconciliation and um, you know, repair, healing. Okay. So the idea is that Attitudes of the heart mediate heartfelt relating, just as deontic reactive attitudes mediate mutual, mutually accountable relating. Both these attitudes, kinds of attitudes, come, they're, they're reciprocating attitudes. They come with an implicit RSVP. They ask, in one case, they demand reciprocation. In the other case, they ask for reciprocation or invite it. Um, they open the heart to another heart. Okay. So, this shows, I think, why it is that there couldn't be a justified expectation to have an attitude of the heart like remorse or love. Uh, love is not something we can demand. Remorse also is not something we can demand. Um, 
in all the cases of the deontic attitudes, we can be motivated to have the attitude or to, well, just by a recognition of the legitimacy of the claim, but through the attitude, we can be motivated to actually do what the other person wants us to do out of respect. But you can't feel love out of respect. So there's no way of, re of coming into a, an attitude of the heart through recognizing the fittingness of an attitude of the will. They're just these two fundamentally different categories. One bottoms out in respect, the other bottoms out in love or care. That's consistent with that, that loving relationships between you know, certainly mature adults typically involve respect as well as love. But we can still distinguish between the aspect that is distinctive of love and the aspect that is distinctive of respect. <coughs> What do I mean by the heart? Well, I just mean a bundle of emotional susceptibilities and vulnerabilities. I just mean the openness to feeling remorse, <laughs> the openness to feeling gratitude, the openness to feeling love, the openness to feeling uh, um, you know, any of these attitudes of the heart that is to relate to someone in a heartfelt way. So, and when those things do open one to another, then you get heartfelt connection. So heartfelt connection is the analog to mutually accountable relating. Now, if you were skeptical that there really is a distinction between remorse and guilt, I present my empirical research. Now, this was on a particular day. I invite you to replicate this experiment uh, at your leisure. Those of you who have computers and are bored, you, you could do it right now. Um, so the contrast is between attitudes like love, grief, appreciation and gratitude, joy and sadness and remorse on the one hand, which I'm arguing are, are attitudes of the heart, and the deontic examples. Indignation, blame, resentment, guilt. Obviously, many, many fewer examples of that. I mean, there should be zero, right, if people really made distinctions in the right way. But that's not bad. That's not bad at all. So I, I have to say, before I did this, I was kind of skeptical that people made that distinction in the way they speak, but they do. It's like the distinction in English between jealousy and envy. I don't know if you know that distinction. Most people tend to use the word exactly the same. But there's a very important distinction. Envy is of somebody else for what they have that you don't have. Jealousy is the fear of loss of, of, of a place in a relationship. So jealousy can give rise to rage. Empathy does not give rise to rage. Very different attitudes, even though we tend to use the words the same. I haven't tried to do this for... Um, for those. Okay. Now, here's a caveat. Even though I'm saying that these attitudes themselves don't involve any legitimate claims or demands, or the address of any putatively legitimate claim or demand, nonetheless, they often come in relationships where there are understandings about what the relationship is about, and what we've implicitly committed ourselves to, and who's going to watch the kids, and so forth and so on. In those situations, resentment, <laughs> blame, guilt, yeah, those can be warranted. But they're not warranted just by the existence of love, pure and simple. That's the idea. So compare a duty to be careful versus a duty to care. Being careful is something you do with your will. You try to put you know, make sure you don't put yourself in uh, situations where your care, for example, might go away. Um, so, you know, you could be careful with someone's heart. That's different. That's a matter of the will. Uh, taking pains and so on. Taking steps. Not being negligent. Not being careless. Not being careless. That's a matter of the will. That's different from caring less, which is a matter of the heart. Okay. 
So here's some of the things I've written that will make their way in various forms into the book. This is a paper that's called Love's Second Personal Character, Reciprocal Holding, Beholding, and Upholding. And uh, uh, it, this is the first of the papers in which I started to pursue these ideas. Just take the idea of holding, for example. What is it to hold someone? Well, you can't hold someone if they're resisting <laughs> you. Uh, I mean, the police hold people in a sense, but it's not the sense that we, you know. The holding involves an implicit, would you let me hold you? And if the person lets you hold them, then that's a reciprocation. Of course, if they hold you back, that's even more of a reciprocation. Okay. So the idea is that love um, invites its object to be together in one another's presence. Uh, what is that? It's a second personal space of heartfelt relating, of affective and emotional sharing. So I have another paper called Being With that explores that idea. First, the very idea of presence, which turns out to itself to be a second personal notion. But here's an example. You can't be in the king's presence if you happen to see the king uh, get up from bed or doing his exercises or something like that, right? Being in someone's presence is being present to them. And being present to them it always involves some implicit reciprocation. Um, okay, and the idea is that presence, therefore, necessarily comes into second personal relating. I don't know if you've ever, if a friend or partner has ever said to you when you're looking at your phone and they're right there next to you, and they say, "I don't, I don't feel like you're present. <laughs> you know, you're, you've gone away." Uh, or you know, you're, I don't know what you say in, in, in Czech, but teacher calls the roll in the United States, and, and the students say, "Present," right? And that doesn't just mean in this space; it means here and ready to relate to you. So presence is a matter always of it, either actual relating or implicit relating or being open to relating. And so uh, love is conceptually connected to desire to be in someone's presence, which is this idea to be in emotional connection with the other person and um, relating to them. In yet another example I want to spend a little bit more time on uh, is the example of gratitude. So. I also claim that gratitude is the second personal attitude of the heart. Um, on my analysis, <clears throat> it's an attitude of heartfelt appreciation and thankfulness to a perhaps presupposed benefactor. So, you know, people you can be thankful for the, oops, sorry. Suppose we feel thankful for the weather. Well, we might think, well, who gave us the weather exactly? The thought is it, it feels as if it's a gift. Whether it is a gift or not, you know, I leave to your theological beliefs. Um, but there's a difference between just being pleased that we have good weather and being thankful. And being thankful is, is receiving it as a gift. And receiving it as a gift is receiving it into your heart as a gift. It's opening yourself up. So, you know, if you've got a guy who's just sort of shut down and closed and so on, and it's beautiful weather, and you say, look, this beautiful weather, and he says, yeah, bah humbug, okay. And so you say, no, no, you know, open up, open the weather, take in the weather. It's, you know. Okay, so um, there's some competing theories out there. One is Kant's. Uh, Kant says that gratitude consists in honoring a person because of a benefit he has rendered us. The feeling connected with his judgment is respect for the benefactor who puts us under obligation. Sounds pretty serious. Uh, whereas the benefactor is viewed only in a relation of love toward the recipient. And Kant's idea is that this obligation you have to your benefactor is something you can never repay, because they gave it to you first, right? So at best, you're Johnny come lately, right? You just, okay, here it is. Um, so that's Kant's theory. Here's Adam Smith. What gratitude is chiefly intent upon is not only to make the benefactor feel pleasure, in, I mean, if you feel the We'll let the analogous analogy between this and the earlier passage about resentment. So in this case, what gratitude is chiefly intended upon is not only to make the benefactor feel pleasure in his turn, 
but to make him feel pleased with that conduct and to satisfy him that the person upon whom he bestowed it, his good offices, was not unworthy of them. Okay. It's like mutual esteem. It's like, whoa, good on you, and I hope you think that you didn't waste it on somebody who's not worthy of something like that. Now, um, I think neither of these theories can explain a very important datum, which is the role of gratitude in subjective well-being. So if you ever watch Oprah, for example, you know, or any, you know, you go into any airport uh, bookshop, if they still have them, uh, and there'll be these books about, you know, you know have, write a gratitude diary. Because if you do, you'll feel much better. And it's true, it, it, it's just, just there's empirical confirmation for this, that people who um, are mindful of their, their uh, well, mind, gratefully mindful, let's put it that way, uh, they then feel good. It's like life is giving them stuff. And it's not, it's not like they just feel lucky or fortunate, right? It's like, no, they feel, it opens them. Um, it, it gives them a kind of emotional connection. Now, uh, so here are some of the references, Emmons and McCullough, and also Peters, Peterson and Seligman. If you just Google those names, you'll, you'll find a lot of these articles. And the thought is, well, what explains the connection is the role of gratitude in heartfelt relationship and the importance of heartfelt relationship in subjective well-being or happiness. What did Aristotle say? Without friends, no man would choose to live. Uh, and if you look at you know life expectancy of guys who divorce versus you know their spouses who they divorce, the women do live much longer because they have friends. <laughs> right? And the men tend not to have friends, or not as many friends. Or if they have the friends, they're just watching NFL football together or something like that. They're not really sharing much. But I, I hasten to say it's possible to share a lot without saying a whole lot. Yeah. I speak on behalf of male friendship. <laughs> Laura says, well, what did you talk about? Did you well, we talk about philosophy? Oh, oh. But I assure you there was love here. <laughs> um, so this last example is trust. Uh, trust also, as I understand it, is the second personal attitude of the heart. I mean personal trust, the kind of trust that's involved in loving relations. Um, and hope also goes in this category. So, uh, yeah, Ludwig was also showing me uh, something from St. Paul, uh, from the Gutenberg Bible. Uh, and St. Paul has this letter to the Corinthians, famous passage about love. Uh, he says, these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Well, all of these are attitudes of the heart, and love is the master attitude of the heart, but Hope is like trust. And I don't mean hoping that something will be the case. Hopes that we place in someone. Trust that we have for someone. Not just trusting that P, but trusting Jones. And not just any kind of trusting Jones, but the kind that's involved in loving relation. Okay. So we can graph all of these attitudes, the deontic and the non-deontic attitudes, in the following way, uh, there, you know, <coughs> we've got two different kinds of attitudes, the deontic ones, uh, attitudes of the will, and the non-deontic ones, the attitudes of the heart. And there, there are different modes of awaiting response, and there are different responses to fulfillment, and there are different responses to frustration. So with the deontic ones, uh, so it comes with an RSVP, so you have the attitude, let's say blame, and what are you waiting, what are you waiting for? Well, you have an expectation of the other person that they will respond. That's not an expectation that they'll respond, it's an expectation of them that they'll respond. Um, if they do respond, right, I mean, it's no particular response, there's no positive thing here, it's just, you can just do wrong, right? When it comes to requirements, you can just violate them. There's no way of, you can go above and beyond, but from the perspective of the requirement, it doesn't matter. 
So with respect to the blame or the, ne the deontic reactive attitude, uh, response to fulfillment is basically the canceling of the attitude, not that there's some positive response. In response to frustration, well, that's another deontic reactive attitude, like further blame, further. In the case of the attitudes of the heart, the mode of awaiting response is not expectation of, it's something more like hope. And the response, if the hope is fulfilled, is joy, gladness. And the response, if the, ho the hope is not fulfilled, is sadness or personal hurt. So I remember one of the most, or disappointment, that's what my father would say to me. <laughs> Devastating. Worst thing I ever did, I won't tell you what it was. But afterwards, my father said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really disappointed in you, Steve. I said, oh, God, please, just get angry at me. <laughs> I can't deal with this disappointment. I want your heart. I want you to love me. Because you can love me and still be angry at me. In fact, it turns out that personal anger requires a background of love of some kind. Personal anger is different from indignation or, or blame. Yeah, okay, so those are the differences. But now, what's alike about them, what makes something a reactive attitude in general, is this structure. That is, they all first come from a second person standpoint, or the participant standpoint. They all involve an implicit RSVP. They call for reciprocation. In the one case, they expect it or demand it. In the other case, they invite it and hope for it. Um, and the deontic ones uh, expect respect, and the non deontic ones invite and hope for reciprocating heartfelt attitudes. But there is this thing that just runs through both of them, namely they're both reciprocating attitudes, and they, also, they involve an implicit address, and they uh, involve uh, an RSVP. And with that, I'll leave that and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Excellent. So we get we have a good half an hour for questions and answers. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hands. Uh, I don't know most of your names, so I'll try to you know point fingers. Yeah, don't blame me for that. Uh, yeah. Any any questions? Yes. So my question is sort of aimed at the problem of problematizing the distinction between will and heart. Yeah. Um, and the case uh, that I think is interesting is the case of forgiveness. Yeah. Asking for forgiveness. Yeah. Because when I um, look at forgiveness, you know, in terms of the of the table that you have right there at the end, yeah. it seems to me that it should be more about the heart. Uh, yeah. You know, I uh, I don't expect the other to forgive me. I hope that you will. Right. And if it doesn't, I don't feel resentful. Right. I feel joy. You know, yeah. Sorry, if he doesn't, uh, I don't feel resentful. <laughs> feel sad. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, and if I, if I feel resentful, I, I'd say that that wasn't a genuine asking for forgiveness. Right. Uh, and yet, it seems to me that when I ask someone for forgiveness, I implicitly assume that he is in the position of an authority that can judge me as, you know, to use it in the use a religious terminology, yeah. who can recognize me as a sinner, yeah. and as such, must be someone who has the authority Good. of recognizing me as a sinner. Right. Good. Right. So, yeah. what would be your take on yeah. forgiveness? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there are two parts of it I'd like to, well, one I was thinking of, uh, that I thought you were going to say, but didn't, and then what you actually said. So let's take what you actually said first. So right, uh, you can only forgive wrongs culpable wrongs. So you can only be a being who can forgive if you also have a conscience and are presupposing that the other person has a conscience as well. Right? So it's always within a background of mutual accountability. But it may not itself be a move within mutual accountability. And so I take what you were saying, I just agree with everything that you said, and that would put it on the heartfelt side, and so it's an attitude of the heart. But then we just have to note, as you're pointing out, that it only makes sense in a structure where we're accountable to one another. Now, there's another thing that I didn't realize before I started to write this book, 
And that is there are two kinds of forgiveness. There's deontic forgiveness and there's non-deontic forgiveness. What do I mean by deontic forgiveness? Um, Bishop Butler in his sermons has uh, some stuff on forgiveness. And he says that what it is is forbearing resentment. Okay? So the idea is uh, somebody did you wrong, you resent them for having done you wrong, um, but then let's suppose they apologize, they hold themselves accountable to you, and now you withdraw your resentment. You think you have no further claim against them. Okay? I would call that deontic forgiveness. But you still might not let them into your hearts. right? So you can have this case of, you know, you know he says, she says, right? Do you forgive me? Yeah, I forgive you. So, are we okay? Yeah, yeah we're okay. Um, can we go out now? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I, I'm too hurt. I, I just have to get through this. And maybe I will get through it, maybe I won't get through it. But I can't, in my, I can't forgive you in my heart, basically. I think those are two recognizably different phenomena. But yeah, thanks for the question. More questions? One, two, yeah. Um, thank you uh, from the Department of Philosophy from the German Studies. So, my first question in this case, a uh, more um, uh, question to the history of culture. Yeah. Uh, your quote is uh, Smith um, and Kant, for example. So um, I think uh, your presentation was transferred. I'm not sure whether it was subscribed or anything, but it's transferred. I think it's clear. Um, my question is that um, another step could be to analyze. Is it necessary? Mm -hmm. I to, to, an, so far, yeah. to, to analyze um, whether there was some kind of um, domination of a deontic based morality in certain epochs yeah. and um, the other way around. Um, I think it is quite good uh, structure to demonstrate um, certain movement in the, uh, in the 18th century, for example, the race of um, German con culture, it's uh, in Finsamkeit, so it's uh, age of sensibility was. Yeah. Yeah. So my yeah. question is whether you you went this way as well. Yeah. So today I've been wearing my moral psychology and moral philosophy hat. I also do history of ethics. And uh, so I have a book that's coming out in May called Modern Moral Philosophy from Grotius to Kant, which Grotius is middle of the 17th century and Kant is towards the end of the 18th century. And I'm working also on a volume to follow that, which will be Modern Moral Philosophy after Kant. Now that could go anywhere, but, but it's going to end. <laughs> you know, if I finish it, uh, it's going to end, I hope, at the end of the 20th century. Or I might call it the long 20th century. I want to get some more stuff in. Okay. Now, one of the things that's just quite remarkable about the history of ethics, I think, is uh, the development of the idea of deontic morality. So certainly in the 18th century, uh, it's, you know, it's the dominant conception uh, in the West. Kant would be a, a good example of someone who's theorizing deontic morality. He starts off the groundwork of metaphysics and morals saying the reason why we need a priori groundwork for morality is because of the concept of duty. Duties pur purport to have a kind of universality and necessity that could only be established a priori. Uh, if you look at the ancient Greeks, uh, I don't mean ancient Greek culture, I mean ancient Greek philosophers like Plato and Aristotle. They don't really theorize deontic morality. So here's a good example of it, uh, of the phenomenon. 
at the beginning of the Republic, you have this discussion between Glaucon, Adamantus, and Socrates. Uh, and Glaucon comes along and says, well, Socrates, uh, look, everybody thinks that there's no reason to be just yourself uh, unless it's necessary to cause other people to be just towards you. Sort of Hobbesian idea. Um, uh, and uh, Socrates says, well, uh, I hear that, um, but I disagree with that. And so what Socrates goes on to argue is that there's always a reason to be just, but it's not simply because justice requires it. It's because justice is intrinsically good for the just person. It achieves a certain kind of harmony of the soul. Okay. It never occurs to anybody in that debate that the mere fact that it's just sorry, uh, provides reason enough because justice is something we're morally obligated to comply with. Okay, so, so and so I make the argument that it's, it's with Grotius uh, and his Foundations of Natural Right um, that moral philosophers become what Elizabeth Anscombe called modern moral philosophers. They're trying to theorize this notion of morality, which is deontic morality in precisely the sense I was, I was talking about. But they're also critics of deontic morality. Nietzsche is an obvious example. Spinoza is probably another example. Uh, and in the 20th century, there are people like Bernard Williams and maybe Annette Byer to some extent, some others. Um, so that's not the only thing that people have been doing. But, so, but Nietzsche, in a way, they're honoring the conception I mean, that it's, it's importance in existence by trying to argue against it. Um, I'll just say one last thing that may be helpful in connection with these attitudes of the heart, because I haven't said anything about them yet in this connection. Marx uh, makes an argument against the idea of rights or against deontic morality more generally. Uh, and I was just telling Mate about this uh, 20th century Soviet legal theorist named Evgeny Pachikhanis, who has an utterly brilliant book about arguing that the very ideas of a moral and legal subject, such as you know, the person as a mutually accountable equal, those, those are ideas that capitalism brings onto the stage they're necessary ideas for capitalism, but they're not, from an ethical standpoint, or I'm thinking of ethical as sort of a broader perspective than just deontic morality, you can criticize these notions as alienating us from one another. So Marx's economic and philosophic manuscripts and his On the Jewish Question makes the argument that a better way of relating to one another would be in a non-deontic way. And you know, he doesn't say a whole lot about what that would be, but I, I think it would be a form, has in mind a form of love or solidarity. Um, but yeah, the, the, you know, I'm talking about these conceptual structures as though they're, you know, they're, they're sort of transcendental things uh, and they don't have historical location. But the conceptions do have a historical location and they weren't always with us and they have a history and that's important to keep in mind. Thanks for the question. This is a very superficial question. I was just curious when um, you had a list of the attitudes of the will and attitudes of the heart. Yeah. On the heart side of the will, there was something like guilt and blame, uh, attitudes of the heart for love and gratitude. Yeah. And what struck me is the attitudes of the will always seem to be negative. What's what, sorry? Seem to be the negative ones, almost oh. always. Yeah, and good. I wonder good. if that's a coincidence or if that tells us something about the will from yeah. being activated and yeah. something that's short. Yeah. So when I say the will, I, there obviously are forms of will that are not forms of what we might call moral will. So um, a one-year-old, a two-year-old, let's say, can be quite willful, right? A dog can be quite willful in a sense, but lacks the capacity for moral accountability. Uh, Ralph Cudworth, a 17th century Cambridge Platonist who wrote in England, uh, distinguished between <coughs> animal free will and moral free will. 
So when I say attitudes of will, I should more carefully say attitudes of moral will. Okay, now this now to your question. I sort of implicitly noted this along the way when I said that there was nothing in particular in the box. Uh, yeah, none. <laughs> right, so if the other person responds, uh, oh, sorry, if they, if they fulfill the expectation, then basically what happens is you drop the expectation, the specific expectation. So somebody stepping on your foot, you say, would you please, uh, you know, I have a right that you not step on my foot. They take their foot off and they apologize and they say, yes, I shouldn't have done that, okay? And so now, now do they get anything positive for that? No. They took, they, you know, I had a right that they not take, you know, it's, I mean, there are some cases where you know, we think it's difficult to do what their obligations are and we might feel grateful to them for it. But ordinarily, we don't feel grateful to someone who just complies with what we have a right to. Yeah. So, uh, and this turns out to be very important. So, th there are actually a number of interesting points here. If you read English translations of Aristotle, or if you read Hume, which is in English, obviously, then you keep seeing praise being given as a contrary to blame, right? This, I think, is profoundly, well, it's, it's assuming a different conception of blame than what I have in mind. What Hume means by blame is just negative esteem, disesteem of motive or character. There's nothing second personal about that. In fact, Hume is quite upfront about this. Hume says that the very distinction between what he calls moral virtues on the one hand and natural abilities on the other, like the distinction between um, being a benevolent person, a just person on the one hand, and being a witty person on the other. He says that's purely a verbal distinction. Okay. Um, but praise is a speech act. There's no attitude of praise. Praise is a speech act that expresses esteem. Esteem is the attitude. Esteem is a third personal observer's attitude of you know, positive response from, from a certain kind of disinterested, impartial perspective to someone's uh, motivation or to their character. Um, okay, blame is the negative. It's disesteem, a kind of moral contempt, uh, looking down on them morally. That ain't blame in the sense that I'm talking about here. Blame is a second personal attitude that implicitly holds the other accountable and says, hold yourself accountable. So yeah, and, and there's a really interesting empirical confirmation of this. Uh, Cosmides and Tubi are some psychologists, anthropologists, who have shown that uh, uh, this distinction is hardwired into us, and it's, I can't really describe the experiments. They're beautiful experiments that involve assessing the truth of counterfactual conditionals. And it turns out people are much better at assessing the truth of counterfactual conditionals when it concerns a violation of a requirement than they are about doing something good. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a very idea of a violation. You either violate or you don't. It's, you can't go on the plus side of it. And we do have this notion of super irrigation, going above and beyond. But that's not, you know, when you feel esteem for someone or grateful to someone for going above and beyond, if you've been benefiting from it, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a different kind of response. Yeah, that's, that's the thought. So thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for this. I. I find the classification very useful and valuable. Uh, but I was wondering how well it applies to some of the more complex attitudes. And uh, you've already <coughs> hinted in your reply to the question about forgiveness. Uh, 
that uh, it can have an aspect of a deontic attitude and non-deontic. And, uh, and another case in point that I am thinking about is, is the attitude of respect. Yeah. And you, and, uh, and it seems to be a prevailing wisdom uh, today that, you know, all humans uh, uh, are entitled to respect and, uh, and should obtain respect and, and yet in personal lives, you know, there are all kinds of people we do not respect, have no respect for yeah. and, uh, and in interpersonal uh, relations, we, we say things like, you know, you need to earn my respect, you need to win my respect. Right. And uh, so, uh, it would seem to me that there may be several levels to respect, uh, uh, respect as uh, acknowledgement on a deontic level and respect as acceptance yeah. on on an attitude of the heart. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm almost completely with you. Uh, I veered off at the end. Please, let me say why. So, I think the second paper I ever wrote in 1977 was a paper called Two Kinds of Respect. Right. So all I do is make distinctions. That's all I do. I'm just a conceptual line drawer. Uh, and so that's the puzzle, right? The puzzle was we both think everybody's entitled to respect. But we also think, oh, hey, people can deserve more or less respect and they can earn respect. It's just two different attitudes. The first attitude is what we've been talking about here. It's what I call recognition respect. And the other attitude I've called in that article appraisal respect, it's just moral esteem. Okay? And so there's no puzzle, two different attitudes. And they're related attitudes, and you know, it's not like they're unrelated. Moral esteem is for how someone conducts themselves with respect to whether they, were, whether they respect other people in the recognition sense. So these are quite related attitudes. Now, I don't think that appraisal respect is not, for me, an attitude of the heart. That's what was involved in the Smith quote about gratitude. The idea is, you know, you do something good for me, and then I'm, Smith says, well, then I, I feel esteem for you as a benefactor and hope that you esteem me as a worthy beneficiary. I'm sure that exists. It's just not gratitude. It's not this, it's, it's, and it's nothing about the heart there. That's just, you know, brought up. So a mutual admiration society is not a relationship of love. Uh, <clears throat> I have this thought experiment, but I think it's very helpful in getting this idea across. Um, you know how when, let's say, uh, singers, uh, opera singers, or um, uh, someone singing German leader or something like that at a recital, how they receive the applause of the audience, they go like this, you know. Um, so imagine that instead of that kind of display, we just had installed in every seat a device which registered how good you thought it was, right? It's like, you know, like ice skating. Right? So everybody punches it in, and then, you know, the bell goes off, and the score goes up, and he says, 9.8! My God. Okay, now we could do that, right? Stupid idea, right? I mean, maybe you like the idea. You like the idea? No, no. Maybe it was a good, good idea before the Velvet Revolution, but not now, right? Okay, but, okay so, so the idea is that part of what goes on is the performers put their hearts into the performance, they put themselves into it, and we receive that, and we're grateful for it, and we and get this reciprocating thing going back and forth, where we feel warmly towards them, and they feel warmly towards us. So that's what characterizes the, the attitudes of the heart. Yeah, which is different from 
you know, good job. First of all, thank you for, for the presentation. Uh, I like this distinction. I'm just wondering if it's somehow applicable or transferable on uh, also on non-human agents because what I yeah. you know, feel that yeah. uh, sometimes people also do have yeah. moral attitudes towards yeah. you know, non-human agents, yeah. let's say remorse about the destroyed natural yeah. environment or something like yeah. this. And my question is, um, if you would claim that all such attitudes are just attitudes of the heart, or if you would say that this distinction is not applicable at all, because you know we cannot expect, uh, and it, you know we cannot hope uh, about uh, the response, because yeah. of course we often yeah. you know cannot accept expect any response. Yeah. So this is basically my question. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's extremely interesting, uh, and let's distinguish the distinction between. Um, having an attitude towards, let's say, the environment, if I foul the environment. Uh, and so what's got to be going on in a case like that? Because uh, I'll feel, suppose, suppose I feel remorse. I'm brought to feel remorse for the damage I've done, not just to other animals and other organisms uh, or to human beings, but to nature itself, to wilderness, let's say, itself. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, there's no problem thinking that uh, it, it's to me as if there's a heart there. Uh, and there's this, what was it, the Gaia hypothesis? Yeah. Yeah, G-A-I-A. -A. Edmund Wilson, I guess, had this idea. And, and, and it's not, you know, there's panpsychism and there's all kinds of stuff about sort of seeing all of nature as in some way personal. So I can certainly feel these attitudes of the heart, even if on reflection I can't think that, um, I, can, I can still think it's incredibly sad. Yeah, I just have to think more about that kind of case. Uh, with other animals, uh, I think there are interesting differences. Uh, so you may have seen some of these videos about elephant grief. Uh, it's quite striking. Uh, so other animals can plainly feel all kinds of heartfelt emotions. And if you have a pet, I mean, Coco or a dog, you know, if Coco doesn't have a heart, my life is worthless. <laughs> so we love our dog. It's not just, you know, and we think the dog loves us, but you know, the dog's, you know, I love you. Here we are. Um, but, um, yeah, that's, uh, but, but we don't hold Coco accountable in the same way. And it turns out, if you believe the research of some people like Michael Tomasello, uh, who was at the Max Planck Institute, now he's at, at, at Duke, I guess, and his colleagues, human beings are the only species that we know of who are capable of full-blown mutual accountability. Now, there is like dog guilt, right? So the dog you know, looks down on you, catch, you know, but did that come from Coco? You know, I don't think there's any other organism in this house that could have produced that. Uh, and Coco, you know, down. Okay, but it's, it's still different. Uh, it's not. She's not recognizing the legitimacy of our demand and holding ourselves accountable to us as a mutually accountable equal. Yeah. So there, you know, there, there are lots of distinctions to be made here. Uh, thanks, this was pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, my question is I guess, uh, similar to what was uh, uh, just asked uh, a minute ago, but I would push you more on, a, on the humans, on the attitude toward humans where we are very much sure that on the other side nothing is happening because the person is in vegetative state or some, you know, yeah. just, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, where certainly accountability is non-existent, but love is expected or at least care is expected, you know, heartfelt through. Uh, although it's perfectly rational for all of the players involved to know that the receiving party has 
nothing to offer. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, it's sort of philosophy yeah. of mind slash uh, yeah. care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, those, those are very interesting cases. Uh, and we can even distinguish the case where there's a, a dead body there, a recently expired body, let's say. Um, so it has just passed from a case of someone with advanced Alzheimer's, let's say, who can't really relate. Um, and I guess I would say that, um, so again, we will always have this distinction between the emotion, which involves a feeling as if something is the case, um, where we think you'd be inhuman if you didn't have the feeling, even if you know it's not the case, right? So, uh, so suppose what you do is, well, this is very complicated. So we think that even if someone's no longer alive, suppose we have a case of someone who, you know, in full dignity as a person, and then they die, and then there's the body. Okay. And now it looks like, well, there's kind of a, some kind of respect for the body, for the person's remains, that we can expect. Um, and, and this distinction between what we as the moral community can respect, can, can expect, versus what can be expected, not you, I, you know, I obviously I hesitate, by that person, well that person can't expect anything, they're dead. But on behalf of that person, right? So the idea would be that even though the person is dead, that doesn't mean that, as it were, the moral person is dead, or that the legal person is dead. So people can have rights that can be violated after their death. Uh, they can't claim them, but obviously other people can claim them on their behalf, members of their family, and so on. So that's one thing to say. Um, and even where we can't sustain the belief, we can sustain the feeling as something that even if it's not strictly speaking, fitting, because what you're, the way things seem to you is not actually where they are. Uh, uh, nonetheless, it would make sense for you to have the feeling. It'd be inhuman if you didn't have the feeling. Um, okay, but then, uh, then it, but there's nothing about the heart necessarily involved at this point. But, but also, you say, well, love could be expected. Uh, expected you could expect that you would feel love, sure, certainly. You'd be in if you didn't. Um, uh, you feel love towards the person who's now passed. Uh, something that, you know, you certainly, the way you're careful with their remains can express love. Who exactly is it toward? Uh, maybe again, it's toward the person though they're not able to reciprocate. And, and so here again, so just as we have the moral person outliving, as it were, the physical person, we might have the beloved person, uh, the person as, you know, the person who is lovable. There's reason for us to love that could still be there as an ongoing object of, of that attitude. You, know, you may be the fitting object. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of different possibilities here, uh, not that I haven't really thought fully through, but they're there for people to, to think through. Yeah, thanks for that. So if we speak about the normative ethics, about ethics, mm -hmm. we define these ethics sometimes as the theory of normative reasons. And yeah. the ethical force is normative force and the fundamental yeah. uh, concept in ethics. Yeah. So, and if you speak about the normative reasons, yeah. it should also exist the normative attitudes. Yeah. And the question is, what is the difference or what is the relation between the normative reasons and the normative attitudes? Yeah, great. So first let me... This is, an opportunity, this is an opportunity to make a distinction between normative ethics in the broad sense and deontic morality in the narrower sense. 
This is the distinction that Bernard Williams, for example, makes between what he calls ethics on the one hand and morality on the other. Uh, Alan Gibbard makes the distinction between um, the narrow sense of morality and the wider sense of morality. It doesn't matter what words we use. The distinction is just between a, a, a most general notion of what we call normativity. And we can use the idea of ought, we can use the word ought to express that idea, understood in a certain way. We can use the word normative reason to express that idea. Um, and you can, sorry, there's, there's just a number of distinctions people might want to draw, but for our purposes, let's just distinguish between the non-deontic ought or normative reasons, as in, I have reason, which will come in with love, for example. If you love someone, you're seeing them as worthy of concern, anyone's concern. And you think, therefore, their well-being provides a reason for anyone to try to promote it. Okay, that's a, We could call that an ethical thought. Even in the case where there's no thought that anybody's obligated <coughs> to promote it. So the, la the latter is this deontic moral thought. Okay, now what, you know, is there a most fundamental normative notion? Um, people, I think, tend to believe there is, but they differ about what it is. Some people think it's the idea of normative reason. These are the philosophers who call themselves reasons firsters, right? So. And the idea is that any normative notion has to involve the idea of a normative reason in its core. And what makes different normative notions different normative notions are the different kinds of attitudes for which there can be normative reasons. So for example, take the idea of the desirable. That's what there's reason to desire. Take the idea of the esteemable. That's what there's reason to esteem. Take the idea of dignity. That's what there is reason to have recognition, respect towards, um, and so on for, for all of, for, and so the claim is that any normative notion has to have the idea of a normative reason or reasons in there. And normative reasons are always reasons, and this is a hugely important point, for attitudes, including among attitudes intention as the attitude that's implicated in action, of choice. Um, so, so you ask, what makes something a normative attitude? Um, well, if it's true, as I just said, that all normative notions implicate the idea of normative reasons for some attitude or other, well, then there'll be the attitude, which is implicated in the normative notion. So I've been arguing that blame, worthiness, is implicated in the idea of moral wrong. The very concept of moral wrong just is the concept of an act that would be blameworthy, lacking excuse. Because that's one sense of normative attitude. Attitude for which there can be normative reasons. Another sense of normative attitude is attitude for which there are normative reasons. Attitude that's, more, that's, that's justified. So is that, is that helpful or? Yes, thank you. Yeah, good. Well, let's have the last hopefully quick question. All right, I have uh, thank you. Uh, I have a, a quick question. So I have a twofold question originally. <laughs> First one will be quick. You have just mentioned it. Uh, you know, uh, Strassen's uh, paper, uh, Freedom and Resentment, and uh, reactive attitudes, they are often quoted in relation to the subject of moral responsibility. And uh, you just used the word justify, which I wanted yeah. to ask about. Because yeah. uh, I want to ask about your understanding of being justified Great. in relation to the attitudes of the heart, and well, that would be the second part, Good. the response to the frustration of uh, those attitudes yeah. of the heart yeah. being uh, frustrated. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So justification is another one of those terms that can mean different things. 
I think what we typically mean in the in the sense that you had in mind is there being normative reasons. So an attitude is justified just in case there are normative reasons for it. Uh, not or I put it this way, there is normative reason for it. That is on balance. There is normative reason to have the attitude. Now I mentioned the reasons firsters, they're not the only people who in the game here. So there are also people who are fittingness firsters, and there are people who are ought firsters. But the fittingness idea uh, is particularly relevant here. So we could put the question of whether um, a certain response is justified or not as the question of whether it would be fitting. Um, and what that means is, uh, so, so what we got, so we've got the case of, uh, we want the case of an attitude of the heart where I have some sort of hope, let's say, let's say I love you, let's say, and I'm wanting your love in response, or at least your acceptance of my love in response, you reject it, let's say. Okay, now, I feel sad, okay, and maybe if, you were encouraging me before, I feel hurt. Okay. Now, what would it be for that to be justified? Well, um, what it would be, this is going to sound silly, but it's true. Uh, what it would be for it to be justified is just for the case that it really is sad. So that I'm sad is a statement about me. That the situation is sad is a normative claim about the situation. It's saying that the attitude of being sad is justified or fitting. It fits the normative profile of the actual situation. So in this broad sense, the idea of normative reason, fittingness, and ought, you know, so I use ought, I can say, well, for the situation to be sad, it's a situation that one ought to be sad about. Those are just, they all come to the same thing. And I think in the end, there's, this ends up being a boring debate that actually, is, is, as far as I can tell, is completely uh, semantic. I think you can define, I mean, I understand why people think you should be a fittingness first year as opposed to a normative reasons first year and some technical reasons about the so-called wrong kind of reason problem. I think it can be solved. Uh, but the crucial thought is there's a most general notion of normative reason or justification or ought um, and uh, we're all and any normative thought we have is involving that notion together with some attitudes and the thought it would be sad well the attitude is sadness and the thought that it would be sad is to say that the attitude is such that the fitting response to have to it is sadness the attitude helpful not helpful <laughs> i'm feeling sad <laughs> Toss the phone. All right, we're out of time. Oh, no, no. <laughs> and that, that's sad objectively, but uh, yeah, we need to end now. So let's thank Professor Darwell for his talk. And uh, thank you all for, for coming, of course. Thank you. <laughs>